Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 28, 2015. This is the week in charts. I know I say this every weekend. Every weekend? Every week. But this week, it's been a long week. Ready for the weekend. This week, I really mean it. So uh, i got a lot to cover. So I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this free endorsement. But hey, PepsiCo, if you're out there, I would appreciate it. Anyway, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what do we talk about? Well, I'd rather just talk about it than talk, tell you what we talk about. But um, I want to talk about discretion. Uh, I want to talk about how the fact that markets go up and markets go down. I know a big dull on that, but I think it's going to make a lot of sense when we get to it. I'm also going to touch upon the TKO. Getting a lot of questions on that, so a lot of uh, a lot of great feedback from the webinar I did on Tuesday night. So I want to follow up on that. Anyway, let's just hop right into it. Okay, um, this is one from yesterday, and this is a stock that's been in a portfolio for a little while. And you can see it started out looked like it was a major bottom and began to take off from the lows and. We had one little bar pullback. Now, remember, when you're trading a transitional pattern like a bow tie or a first thrust, you want to get in early. You want to wait for that nice, deep pullback over a number of days and look for that perfection in that pullback. Sometimes you just get one little blip lower, and then you need to look to get in. Otherwise, you'd be left behind. Be left behind. And you can see we had a pretty nice move out of it, and this was the original trade back here on the second this is just a snapshot straight from the portfolio from yesterday's portfolio and you can see we got a thousand dollars in that first loaf by taking that initial profit and then we were trailing that stop higher and notice that this stop just flatlined and the reason it flatlined was because the stock stopped making new highs okay so until it starts making new highs, and not just like a little blip higher like right there, but a significant new high, we don't start trailing that stop higher. So we had to stop up to break even. And then barring overnight gaps, the worst we could do is break even in the rest of the trade. At least at the beginning of the trade, we make a nice little profit, nice little swing trade profit. Annualize that out. It's pretty good. Now, notice that yesterday it came down and it did what I call a stop nick, Okay. And you can see the day before, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail too, that if the price is here, that's the closing price, and then the stop is here, you can tell that, well, or you know, I should say that, you know it's pretty close, and there's a pretty good chance you're going to get stopped out the next day. So you could be prepared to exercise a little discretion if necessary. So you can see, here's a stop at 147. And that was predict not um, not predictive, but that was from the night before because we bumped it up to 147. It's been there forever. And notice that it hit 147 exactly. Now I didn't look at the time and sales on this. Usually I do because it makes a wonderful example. And uh, the, the the best example ever was time and sales on one. It was at nine dollars a share, and it was one or two hundred shares. I forget which which, but uh, not much. And at nine dollars a share, that's not a whole lot of trading. At least money-wise, if you multiply the um, share value by the number of shares, like eighteen hundred dollars, right? No big deal. Anyway, the point is, when you know you're getting close to the stop, you can apply a little discretion and watch the open and watch the stock to see what it does. And then as we're we'll talking about just one second, maybe put an alarm in to know where you're getting kind of close to that stop. But most of your discretion is going to be fairly early in the morning, so you don't have to sit here and watch a screen all day. Just kind of keep an eye on what's going on in early trading. And that's not that doesn't mean you watch it for hours. Just watch it for the first few minutes, see what happens, and then go off to save lives and build buildings and do whatever else or other great things that you may do. So the point is that, okay, the stop was at 147. It hit exactly 147, and then it began to turn around and, and rally. So when that happens, you could actually stay with the position. In this case, there was no incremental additional potential loss because it didn't go below that 147. Now, what you need to do 
if you are exercising a little discretion in your trades, remember the market doesn't work on exacts. Whenever I say, okay, look, you turn around right at 147, people are like, well, why do you put your stop at 146? It's like, well, I didn't know. If I knew a market would stop at an exact point, I'd put all my money on that one stock and then um, and then I quit, okay? <laughs> uh, but you don't know. So that's why you do have a stop. And I'm not saying throw caution to the wind, but you can give it a little bit of wiggle room to see what happens. See if it dips below the stop and then turns around and starts going again. Now you have to have what I call an uncle point. An uncle point, uh, for those of you who are not um, from the United States, an uncle point is a point where you give up. You, you, you're in enough pain to where you, uh, you quit. I'm not sure where that comes from. My um, cousin used to torture me and um, make me say uncle for him to quit. So <laughs> maybe that's where it comes from. You give me a, a titty twister. Um, but that's another story. And that, that might explain some of my, my adult problems. <laughs> okay, let's talk about discretion. There are some pros and there's also some cons. So I don't want to make it look like it's the greatest thing in the world. But I think... Once you weigh the pros and the cons, the pros definitely outweigh the cons. So the number one reason that we do this, apply a little discretion on trades, is there is a chance to stay with a major trend. Now, if you're a day trader chipping away at it or you're selling some kind of option spreads or something and you only make a little bit of money on every trade, and then obviously you got to make darn sure – you don't have any um, any situations where you uh, lose a whole lot because then you're not making enough to compensate, and that's what's called an anhill strategy. And um, we'll I've talked about that before, and I'll, I'll cover it again, but that's not where I'm going with this. The point is that. The way the methodology works, and the way the methodology works great is you kind of chip away at it, you chip away at it, you get a few little gains, you can get stopped out, and you might have a few little losses. And then what happens is you just have the mother of all trends. And that's kind of just the opposite of what happens in day trading or some other type of short-term trading or if you're selling options or something where your gains are limited and your losses are potentially unlimited. We're trying to keep the losses in check. And in doing so, a lot of time our gain, a lot of times our gains are in check. But every now and then, we catch it, capture this big outlier, and one or two of those could make your entire year. Sometimes, just one position, even if you're only risking two percent going in, and then you reduce that share position down to only one percent, and if that market takes off, that stock, I should say, takes off, it goes up four or five hundred percent. That could have a 20, 30, or even 40 percent impact on your entire. Excuse me, on your that mountain dew starting to bite me on your entire account for the year. So that one trade can make a year. So that's the importance of trying to hang on to these stocks. So it does give you a chance to stick with a major trim. But again, remember it's a game of and, and remember it's a game of outliers. But here's the deal. Something bad can always happen, okay? Let's say you stuck with this little GFA, and it, 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 it opened a little lower this morning. But let's say you stuck with it yesterday. Well, Dave says it's, if it just kind of barely nicks the stop, we should stay with it. Or even if it dips a little bit below, we should stay with it because the market doesn't move in exacts. So you do that, and then you come in today, and then, bam, the stock gaps lower. And now you've got a bigger loss on your hands. OK, and then, of course, now you're forced out at an adverse price. So something bad could always happen. So you definitely have to weigh the pros with the cons. OK. Now, there are some psychological rewards, psychological rewards by using your brain. OK, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of the psychology of trading. And we'll talk a little bit about that in just one second. In fact, I'd, at some point, I want to do a full-blown course on psychology. And so it's important to always think about the psychological 
benefits and features when you're doing some of these things. And one is, I thought about this this morning, it's kind of like you're beating the system. And there's something mentally stimulating and rewarding about that. It's like, okay, well, I had a stop in place. And had I just blindly followed that stop, I would have got knocked out of this position. This thing turned around and went up hundreds and hundreds of percent. So I beat the system. And that's that's a good feeling, okay? And obviously, there's financial reward. And there's the good feelings that come along with that. Now, we're told we need to control our emotions. And as Denise Schull, and, and now that I'm doing some reading uh, in outside of trading uh, in some other fields, uh, emotions are part of the decision process. And she, and she did a speech in which she talked about that. I think she's written about that. So you can't completely elim eliminate your emotions. If you are in some sort of horrible accident, your emotion part gets taken out of your brain, you can no longer make any decisions. These poor people that have had uh, such uh, things happen to them, if you ask them if you want to meet again on Tuesday or Wednesday, they'll tell you every reason they should meet you on Tuesday and then every reason they'll meet you on Wednesday, but they can't reason between which day they should actually do it. They can't make the decision. And the reason why, there's no emotional consequence associated with that decision. My wife's always on my butt to get a haircut. She wanted me to get a haircut yesterday. It's like, well, if I go get a haircut, I've got to leave my screens, and i got stuff going on. And so there's an emotional thing about even a simple decision is getting a haircut has some emotional consequence attached to it, okay? So there is a little bit of a psychological reward to that, but remember, you can't completely eliminate emotions from trading. There's a fine line between beating the system because it could cause you to ignore the rules in the future with dire results. No, not exactly, because you have to have a plan, okay? So we're not talking about throwing caution to the wind. What we're talking about is here's the stop. And here's the stock right at the stop, okay? And it, here's the open, so it opened close, so you know we had to take some uh, evasive action. You have to be disciplined, as we're going to get into in just one second. And you say, okay, well, I have this uncle point. I'm going to let it dip a little bit below this point, as I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a second. And if it bottoms out, it begins a rally, then you stick with it, okay? But if it hits it and starts going through it, you obviously have to get out. But this little incremental risk down to your uncle point is very small in the big picture, in the big scheme of things, I should say. Because if things work out, and just notice what it did by the end of the day. Notice that this incremental risk here is about a third of the size of just that one bar up. And let's say that this stock continues to rally, it goes up and rallies several hundred percent. Then the incremental risk uh, from here to here is very small compared to from here to here, okay? So, yeah, I hear you. There is a fine line between the two, but as long as you have a plan in place, okay? And as I just said, that slight incremental risk can have a huge reward and payoff, okay? Now, on the flip side, you can feel pretty good about beating the system, but when it doesn't work, you might have some remorse when something bad happens, okay? So the stock comes down, nicks your stop, does this or whatever, and you stick with the position, and you're feeling pretty good, and next day you come in and stock opens down here, okay? So something bad could always happen. So don't forget that. Now, the cons, another one of the cons is, remember, this is going to take, it's going to take a little bit more action is going to be required during the heat of battle. Now I'll show you a few things to work on that and help you with that in just one second. But, yes, you do have to make another decision. And with that decision comes stress. And with that decision comes emotion. Okay? So not to beat the dead horse, but this obviously takes discipline. You cannot be a deer in the headlights. Okay? I get emails all the time from people. Dave, I'm down 40 bucks of this stock. I bought it at 50. Now it's at 10 bucks a share. What do I do? It's like, what do you do? What, what, what you should have done was you should have gotten out 
40 or 50 points ago. Okay. Or I guess in that case, 30 points ago. So you do have to have discipline. So I agree with you, Rich. Uh, it is a fine line with beating the system, but it's also, if you have discipline, then you could do this. Okay. Now, here's the thing, too. I don't want to make it sound like this discretion thing is very elusive. It happens every day and all day long. When I go back and look at uh, all the trades I've recommended historically, and I'll notice that there's only about once every three months where there's some discretion that really should have been applied. Okay, so this particular example, and I like to show you live examples just in case they don't work out, then I have a good example of, hey, well, it doesn't always work, right? And if it works big, I'm like, well, you see, I told you it works uh, sometimes. But this is only about the first time, maybe the second time this year that I remember where some discretion was necessary. So I don't want you to think that you totally abandoned the system. All you're doing is you're slightly bending the rules to accommodate the market conditions, okay? So it's really not that often. I think if I had to quantify it, it's probably literally once every three months, okay? But you have to pay attention for when it does occur. Now, the good thing is usually there's some warning, okay? So, again, if you have a stop here and the stock is here, you know you're that far away. That's pretty tiny, right? You know there's a good chance that that stock is probably going to test that stop, okay? So usually you have a little bit of a heads up going into it. By the way, if you do have, um, if you don't have it, it's, it's on my website on education. And um, all I did was take the PDF out of layman's. There's, if you have layman's, you have my permission to make as many copies of you want uh, that you want of the uh, the plan your trade page and if you don't have layman's look at my website there's a, a, a plan your trade thing uh, trade your plan plan your trade plan your trade trade your plan uh, page PDF and in that I actually have discretion as part of the plan okay so you're not completely abandoning your trade you actually have a little area in the planning of the trade for discretion and again, not to beat the dead horse, but something bad can always happen. Now, one thing that I do see that can happen, and re recently happened with a stock called SID, which we stopped out of. Uh, we stopped out the whole position, I think, as a profit. So it's better than poking the eye. But sometimes you can have, uh, for lack of a better name, a Chinese water torture. So let's say you come in here, and this stock kind of nicks the stop. And then the next, it kind of gets a little bit below. It's like, ah, well, that's no big deal. The next day it kind of goes a little bit lower. And the next day a little bit lower. And, you know, and then if you just keep giving it rub, then before you know it, you get into a lot of trouble. So you do have to have some kind of uncle point in mind. So we're not talking about riding it all the way back down to zero. We're talking about giving it a little bit of rum. But yes, if it does kind of dip a little bit below and then a little bit further below the next day, it just keeps doing this. Eventually, you will have to get out. Otherwise, you're going to end up like the people I just said, talked about a minute, a minute ago. So your trading plan should say a daily close below the stop, not an intraday low. No, no. Okay, uh, he's saying that you're saying it has to close below the stop, not an intraday stop. No, because here's the thing. What I'm saying is, all right, we know it's close here. We know this is where our stop is. Now, obviously, this will have to be a mental stop, or as I'll talk about in one minute, either an alarm set at that level or a contingency order at that level. But let's just call that a mental stop. So you come into this day, and you're like, okay, well, it's pretty close here. Yeah, it doesn't look too good. It looks like it's going to get hit. So at what point am I going to get out, and how much room am I going to give it? So let's say we give it to here. Now, the reason you can't wait until the close is because what could happen between now and the close? Okay. Now, it's probably unlikely, but stranger things have happened. Sometimes the market drops. It just keeps on dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. So you cannot say, oh, I'm going to only get out if it closes below a certain level because you could lose a lot of money intraday. 
Now I know someone. He's retired now, so I guess we talk about it. But uh, he was running billions of dollars, and his rule was he'd wait 30 minutes after a stop was hit, and more often than not, the market would reverse and he wouldn't get stopped out. I cannot recommend that you do that as a private trader. The reason he did that is twofold. One, because a lot of times the market's through correcting and turns around right around that level of where your stop is. If your stop is placed properly, it should be at an area where a market should not go past it, should turn around at or ideally long before that level is hit. But the reason he did that, in addition to that, also was he couldn't just dump his entire position. When you're trading billions of dollars, you've got to scale in, you got to scale out. Okay. As a private trader, we're a little bit more nimble than he is. It's like he's he's like trying to turn that battleship, and we're uh, we're kind of like a, on a jet ski. Okay. So pros and cons, but uh, I thought about it, and I definitely want to put a check mark over on the pros. Now it does take time, and it does take take experience, and obviously it takes discipline to do if you don't have the discipline just trade mechanically or, or trade your stops mechanically i should say until you acquire that discipline okay so it all boils down to making decisions and then of, of course living with them and that's the hard part and this is trading in a nutshell if you could learn how to make decisions and live with them you're going to be very successful in this business okay uh, one thing you could do, there's uh, great alarm systems in, in with brokerages, and uh, TC has pretty good. Uh, Telecharts has good alarm systems, so most any live feed has a really good alarm system. So set an alarm so you know when a stop is neared. Now, if you're coming into today, or, or coming into the trade day, I should say, and like that stock like uh, GFA was close to the stop, you know it's already neared, so you don't need to set an alarm. But if you're in some other stock that gets hit during the day and you're busy saving lives, have an alarm set to go to your smartphone or whatever so you know that you might have to take a little discretion. Now, if you know you're going to be out of pocket or out of touch or busy cutting on someone, you might want to have an airbag stop in just in case. Now, I stole that term from Trading Chaos. I'm pretty sure that's where it came from. I wasn't a big fan of the book. But I like that term, so I borrowed it from the book. So an airbag might be like, okay, this is my actual, this is where my stop should be. I might put in what I call an airbag, like way down here, a hard stop. This will be a hard stop. Okay. And I'm going to apply a little discretion. And, and, and this would be like my uncle part here. I'll get out here. But let's say I'm busy saving lives or somebody, uh, uh, well, something happens. I got to go fight a fire or something, and I can't watch that screen, okay? So this hard stop will take me out. Now, it's going to suck, but I will live to fight another day. This is what, they call, what I call an airbag, okay? It's kind of like a, a last-ditched effort to keep you from imploding. So you could have an airbag. You could leave an airbag in place just in case, okay? But... I would only do that if you know you can't be around, just in case something crazy happens. Now, as uh, Rich alerted, uh, alluded to earlier, you're not abandoning the plan. You're just sort of bending the rules a little bit. And, and when you do on the fly, you still have to have a decision in place. And I think it was SCTY. I had a client a while back. And we had a stop at like, um, I think we had a stop at 16. And he emailed me and said, Dave, I'm going to give it till 1550 because it looks like it's trying to find a little support in here. And if it hits 1550, I am out, no questions asked. And he'll lose an extra 50 cents on the trade. And I replied, hey, I think that's a good idea. So if you're on the service, here's the thing. If you want to, and, and I did get a few calls on, um, when that aforementioned GFA. So I will help you as much as I can apply a little discretion, okay? Until you get good at it and understand what you're doing and have the discipline to do it. 
But anyway, the client uh, emailed me and said, hey, Dave, I'm going to give 50 cent. What do you think? And I was like, I think this is a good idea because it's a $16 stock. Stop is here. You know, stock is about right here at 16. 50 cents was only a little bit further away. Well, let's say the stop is at here. And 50 cents is only a little bit further away, 15.50. No big deal, okay? Stock turned around and went to, uh, I think it rallied to like the 30s. I think it doubled from there. So he got paid off tremendously based on that small incremental risk. Okay. Now, here's where I'm going to open up a little bit of a can of worms. Uh, study your broker's contingency order system, okay? Then implement it if you think it would help. Now, these things get really complex, and this is why I wrote down here. You're on your own, smiley face. Good luck with that, okay? But it's not that difficult once you get your head wrapped around it. But the reason I can't help you is every brokerage in the world has, has a different one. And then, you know, right when I think I've got somebody figured out or whatever, I'm like, okay, uh, here's what I do. And then it's like, well, wait a minute, I don't have that level of account and, and that feature is not available. So it's a can of worms. So what I would recommend you do first is write an algorithm. So your algorithm might say like, well, if the last price is below X, which is your stop, and then the ask is below X, okay, then you want to bail out. So it means that they're actually, um, that's a real market is actually below your stop. So something along those lines, or make sure there's more than just one trade there. And the reason, um, or I should say, uh, back that up a little bit. The great example here was we had a stock that, that again, it was another one of those situations on the open. It had literally like 100 shares at a certain tick. It was somebody that fat fingered a stupid order or whatever, and somebody took advantage of them. And it stopped out mechanically, okay? But this gentleman emailed me and said, hey, Dave, I listened to what you said about discretion, and I inputted a, 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 a contingency order to say that it also must have the ask below that price. That means it's an actual real market, okay? It's not just a bad tick or a blip or something that would have taken that stop out. And he was able to stay with a position for a long, long time, 50 points, I think, if um, if um, memory serves, okay? <laughs> Algo, if Dave's wife says X, do Y. Algo, I don't get it. <laughs> there are smartphone applications with real-time quotes and alerts for free. Oh, okay, Shay. All right, uh, any questions on discretion? We're not throwing caution to the wind. We're just realizing that the market doesn't always move in exacts, okay? And I think everyone here, if you've been trading for more than maybe three days, has gotten stopped out to the penny, and then the dang market reverses, okay? And that's where you could use just a little bit of discretion. Got to make the decision, but you got to live with it. Okay, if the recent market has frustrated you, or if you find yourself ever frustrated, then the market is doing its job. Okay, I'm getting a, a notice on sound. Sound okay, everybody? Oh, we just lost sound for a second here. Well, it should still be working on the uh, recording. Okay. Well, I'm going to keep talking because the... Um, what are we not be recorded? Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. We're back. And that concludes the secret of trading. <laughs> That's an oldie but a goodie. It never gets old. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so if you're frustrated, that's the market doing its job. And yes, in yesterday's column, and I write this often, but I wrote, never forget that the market could do whatever it wants. 
Okay. It everybody tries to make the market do what they want. And boy, if I could, that'd be awesome. But I've given up. I know that the market's going to do what the market's going to do. It does whatever it wants. Now, it's been said that the market will do what it has to do to frustrate the most people. And that is something that I see all the time. In fact, I actually use that psychology, such as the trend knockout, okay, to – I use that to my advantage. And I'll, I'm going to bring up that pattern in just one second. For those of you who don't know it, I'm getting quite a few questions on that. So I'm going to bring that up. So let's take a look at the P's. P's have gone sideways forever. And about a week and change ago, what do they do? They make an all-time high. So a lot of people are like, okay, this is fantastic. The market's at a brand new high. This is great. So they kind of see that as the so-called all clear. And then it kind of bumps along a little bit. And then all of a sudden, no, it's not. Market sells off extremely hard. Now, if you go back a couple of days and read that column I just talked about, then, yeah, it looked a little ugly a couple of days ago in the market. But what do you do? Well, you have stops in place, and you might need a little discretion, like I just said. But as a general statement, you have stops, and you're going to get stopped out if something bad happens. And if the market turns around, hopefully you'll still have some positions left on like we do. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, yes, it is. Okay, so it's the all clear. No, it's not. Yes, it is. One thing, I was in a webinar last night with um, Doug McKinney, and um, he's uh, – he, he likes to follow the news just, just because he he's just amused with it uh, more than anything. He's a tech, technical trader, but he, he likes to follow the news. And he was saying last night how the whole – the media was going nuts because this was like the end of the world. The sky is falling a couple of days ago. And then what happens the next day? The market does nearly a complete 180. So this is why you don't want to get too caught up in the ups and downs of the market. So when you're dealing with the ups and downs, the first thing you have to realize is that markets go up and markets go down. And I know you're thinking, duh, but why is it that people place a trade and the market goes against them and they just freak out? The market didn't do anything wrong. The market did what it's going to do. But people freak out because it goes down. Just because you buy a stock doesn't mean that the market's just going to go up, okay? So it will go down, and something bad can always happen. Keep in mind that logic doesn't often apply. It would be great if we could say, okay, if the GDP is this, and if we show three quarters of economic growth, and if the PE is this or whatever, it would be great if we could mix in some of that logic. But logic doesn't often apply. And don't forget, or never forget, I should say, that there are people behind those little price bars. And I don't know what I want for lunch. I don't know what I'm going to have for lunch. I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I'm going to have for supper. And I might have an idea, but I might change my mind between now and then. So. There are people behind those bars. There's people, and I guess some of them end up behind bars, but <laughs> there are people behind those price bars. And like I say over and over again, I kind of beat the dead horse with this story, but my good friend Dick Fruth over in Houston, um, I forget how much he's running, half a million, uh, not a half a million, 500 million or 250 million, something, you know, millionaire, millionaire, it starts adding up. Um but he's running a substantial amount of money, enough to call it substantial. And he got his start as a broker back in the day where people would walk in and hand you their shares of stock and say, I, I would like to sell this stock. And most of the other brokers would just punch in the transaction and go about their business or whatever they were doing before. But if you know Dick, he's more of a 
I guess gregarious is the word type of person. And he would, he would sit him down and get a cup of coffee and start chit and chatting with him, chit chatting with him. And lo and behold, he'd find out that their selling rarely had anything to do with the stock. I'm getting a divorce. I'm buying a house. I'm getting married. I got to pay my taxes. Okay. I'm in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> I also want a little money. Okay. But rarely, or I should say, usually rarely, did the selling of the stock have anything to do with the stock itself. So you got to realize that how can you expect to apply logic to a market when the lot when the market is made up of a bunch of a bunch of illogical participants? Let me try to say that again more eloquently. How could you expect to apply logic to a market when the market is made up of a bunch of logical Damn it, did it wrong again. <laughs> Illogical participants, okay? Now, keep in mind that every time the market sells off a little bit, doom and gloom, I guess, doesn't, uh, doom and gloom sells newspaper. So, of course, it's always the sky is falling. How many times has the sky been falling since 2009, like it's going to be the end of the world? And what has the market done since? Now, there's we've had a few sell signals where I thought the market could sell off. And it was time to take some evasive action, uh, meaning that we just let the stops take us out and we start taking on a short or two. But we didn't go crazy and sell everything in the portfolio and load the portfolio up with a whole bunch of shorts. We just kind of worked that ebb and flow of the market as it began to sell off a little bit. But how many tops have been called since 2009? I bet a lot. Predict early and often, right? Now, I can't guarantee you that it will always go straight down after its first, that it will, that it won't go straight down after its first bad day. But history suggests otherwise, and we'll take a look at that. And it's kind of interesting. I'm always talking about Rob Hanna, but I never follow up with the research. He's a busy guy. I'm a busy guy. Rob Hanna does a lot of mechanical testing. And what I dig about Rob's research is it's very well thought. And he, what he does is when he goes to trade it, if the market's in an uptrend and a solid uptrend, he doesn't rush out and short it when he gets a short signal. He just pays attention to the signal and does whatever trading he's doing. He might ignore that short signal if the market's headed up. So it's not like he's blindly following the system. He puts a little discretion on it, which I think we have brains in our heads. I think we should use them. So I kind of dig that about Rob. And he was uh, saying some things yesterday about, you know, the market doesn't necessarily top after the first day down. And my takeaway from that is it's more of a process than an event. And, and I've been around some of these other guys that are pretty smart, some of these AAPTA members. And um, that's one of the things that came out of that meeting in Nashville is quite a few people talked about how it, it seems like a top is an event. Bam, got a crash. OK, but. In reality, a top is more of a process than an event. A bottom sometimes is more of an event than a process, which is kind of interesting. It's a little counterintuitive, but that's the beauty of being around these old timers is you learn a lot from them, and that's one of my takeaways. So I can't guarantee you that you won't have a, a market that goes straight down after its first bad day, but history su seems to su suggest otherwise. So I woke up early this morning. I was doing a little research. Uh, we had a bow tie down in 1929, so that means the moving averages rolled over long before the crash, and we'll take a look at that in one second. And we also had a moving average crossover, quite a bit of daylight in the 50 and the 87 crash. Let's take a look at those crashes real quick. This is before the crash in 1929, and this is the Dow Jones 30. And you can see we had a bow tie that formed, okay? And I guess your trigger would be about right here in that bow tie. So a bow tie formed down, so you know that something's wrong with the market, or the market's at least in trouble. And also notice you had plenty of daylight, meaning that the highs are less than the 50-day moving average. So this is the 50-day moving average, and these are my bow tie moving averages here. Okay. Oh, by the way, I'm getting a lot of questions on bow ties. Bow ties or... Um, I have them on my website in the free reports, and I'll show you where to find that in just one second. I put them up there yesterday. So anyway, you have a lot of daylight, meaning that 
there's a gap between the moving average and the highs of the price. And also, the you also had a bow tie. So you had a sell signal on a daily chart. And the reason I'm, I'm showing you moving averages in here is because moving averages have lag. So no, these moving averages rolled over long before this market crashed. And not only that, if you look at that a little bit longer moving average, like the 50-day, two things. One, it turned down. Okay, this is a 50-day simple. And number two, notice that the highs, again, are less than the moving average. So you started having daylight. And then if you count the number of days, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So you had nearly a month of daylight. So after you have a significant amount of daylight in a market, in this case, highs lower than the moving average, you need to start thinking, well, this market might be in a little bit of trouble. Maybe that trend has turned. So you will get some clues. And my point is that, okay, it made a new high here, and then it kind of started working its way lower. And then eventually that was, quote, unquote, the top. But it doesn't make a new high, and the next day it crashes, okay? Now, market could do whatever it wants. Maybe someday it will. But from history, it doesn't appear that that's going to be the case. So let's take a look at the 1987 crash. Now, the S&P did make an all-time high here, made an all-time high here, too. But you could also argue that, well, I made a high here, all-time high here. And, you know, this sell-off wasn't the crash. 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 Uh, this sell-off, well, it ended up eventually being the crash. But the market worked its way a little sideways afterwards. But the thing, your takeaway here is that the moving average is rolled over. And then you had a lot of daylight below the 50-day moving average. And then you broke down out down below this support. So you had a breaking of support. You had moving averages rolling over. You had moving averages crossing over. You had daylight below the 50-day moving average. So, yeah, you might have got out a little late based on waiting for those moving averages or waiting for that breakdown or whatever. But you should have been out long before the crash. I can't guarantee this always will happen. But so far, history has shown that it's a process more than an event, and you will have time to get out of its way. So be careful, and don't get too caught up in all the chicken littles. Now, what's kind of interesting is this is um, more recent bull and bear cycles, and I dug around my hard drive instead of reinventing the wheel, and I found this chart I made. looks like I made it way back in 2009. And these are weekly bow ties. So believe it or not, I mean, 2000, and 2000, I should say, it just seemed like this god-awful bear market that the market just went straight down. But what's fascinating is you had a textbook bow tie moving average. And it crossed. I like it when they cross at a sharp angle on that 50-day like that. So you had this textbook bow tie moving averages crossing over way back in like March of 2000. And then what happened? Market sold off and sold off for three years, okay? Took the market two years to bottom, and then what happens? You had a bow tie off of those major, major lows. And then what happened in 2007? Well, believe it or not, and this is fascinating, Right at the end of 2007, beginning of 2008, one of the worst bear markets in history, you had a weekly bow tie down. So you had plenty of warning. Now, in 2009, it took a little while for that weekly bow tie to form. But if you watch the daily chart, you had a daily bow tie in about April of 2009, and you had a tremendous amount of buy signals back then. But even if you waited for that bow tie to form on a weekly basis, the market is uh, over twice where it is, or what's it has doubled since 2009, since that bow tie in 2009. So kind of interesting. These bull and bear cycles, even on a weekly basis, you could you you could get out long before they get ugly. Okay. Now the other thing too is you got to remember you're going to have let's say you have positions on and the market's been going on. Well, if the market starts rolling over even before it quote-unquote crashes, 
there's a better than average chance that you're going to start getting stopped out of positions. So my whole point here is that, first of all, it usually won't be an event, and no one's going to ring a bell. i got a funny story about that, but we're running late on time. Um, I'll hold it for um, for another section session. Uh, stops will likely start taking you out, like I just said, okay? And sometimes you get pretty lucky, and the ebb and flow just works real beautifully. It's like, hey, we got a short. Let's put the short on. Looks pretty good. So your short start making yeah, that short starts making money. You get oh, we got stopped out along. Oh well, it happens, right? Drop an F bomb, move on, and then you have another short that comes in, kind of like 2007. We had this beautiful ebb and flow where the long starts stopping out. We start losing money, but the short start making money, and the drawdowns are mitigated. It's just a beautiful thing. Doesn't always work that great, but what it does, it could be a thing of beauty. Now, common sense will likely keep you out of new trouble. So stops will start taking you out of position. So you start getting out of position. So you start lightening up. Okay, you pull the money off the table because you're being forced out because the stops are being hit. And then common sense is going to keep you out of new trouble. Now, just let me back up just for one second. Pick any bear market in history, 2000, 2007, 1929, okay, 1987. And I guarantee you, when this market starts dropping like this, okay, now this is only this much. When the market drops that much, and notice that it dropped that much altogether. When the market starts dropping this much, and notice again, in this particular case, it dropped that much altogether. I guarantee you, if you have stops in place on positions, you're going to get stopped out of all your longs once you get that sort of move, okay? So you're going to start getting taken out of all your longs, and common sense is going to keep you out of new trouble. If the market looks like this, and especially if you got like a bow tie down or something, and you're like, hey, I've got this potential buy, and I'm going to buy this stock. It's like, well, geez, I don't know. The market's going down. Should I really buy this stock? Well, you have to think about it. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to buy it anyway because I think it's going to be a great stock because I think it could maybe trade contra to the overall market, or I just love, I love this setup, best setup I've ever seen in my life. Then by all means, take it. But if you can't answer all those questions and justify it, then I can't imagine that you would load the boat and buy a whole bunch of new longs, and again, you'll start firing off a short or two, okay? And what's kind of cool is, if done properly, it doesn't always happen this way, but let's say this is your equity curve, and the market starts selling off, and this is what the market looks like too, okay? And what's kind of cool, go in and watch my YouTube when I did the, um, the discretionary portfolio on the trading service. You will see this exact thing uh, play out. So here's the market. The market begins selling off, and, of course, you go into a drawdown. But guess what? Your equity curve begins to flatten out, and as this trend begins to materialize, guess what happens? You actually start making a little money on the short side. So you could mitigate your drawdowns and actually make a little money through proper money management. And the other thing, too, is internally things will start to unravel. And your own portfolio could be a really good, uh, I guess, harbinger, for lack of a better word. But like right now, we've got, I don't know, uh, 10, 10 positions, 9 or 10 positions still on. And we got knocked out of a couple of them. But if we start getting knocked out of 3 and 4 and 5 positions, then... That might tell me, and usually it does, that things are going to be getting to unravel a little bit. And what happens is you have the overall market, but the overall market is made up of a bunch of sectors. And each sector is made up of a bunch of stocks, okay? So as these little stocks begin rolling over, these sectors start rolling over, and then eventually the overall market rolls over. So this is going to happen at a micro level long before this is going to happen. And you will get knocked out of a lot of your positions. So, again, internally things will begin to unravel. These transitions can suck, but if you never forget that markets go up and markets go down, you do just fine. You're going to be shaken but not stirred, okay? Well, the market sold off, knocked me out. That sucks, okay? But I see some shorts setting up. Maybe I'll start taking some shorts. In longer term, I'll be okay. Or I'll just sit on my hands. Let the market sell off. When it starts going up again, I'll start buying again. If you can get that right, correct mindset and do that, you're going to do just fine. 
And, you know, don't try to outsmart the market. I mean, I joke a lot about being a trend-following moron. But that's really, in all seriousness, that's actually helped me being uh, insulted by being called that. Because it got me thinking, well, why am I trying to outsmart the market? Or anytime I try to outsmart the market afterwards after being called that, I'm like, well, I'm supposed to be a trend follower and the market's going up. Why am I putting on these shorts? Okay. Well, I'm supposed to be a trend follower and the market's going down. Why am I hanging on to these longs past my stop? Why am I trying to buy more stock? Not only not only not honoring my stops, why am I trying to buy more stock? Okay. So it just made me realize that I'm not smarter than the market and I can't let my press clippings go to my head and I just need to follow along. So what if I don't, if I don't look smart, that's a good way of putting it. So, so, so what if I, if I'm not looking smart in this, right? So as soon as you just kind of be like water and just follow along and not try to outsmart the market, your life is going to get a heck of a lot easier. Is your stop on the bid or ask? My stop is on the price, whatever that might be, okay? Now, I use mental stops, so it's not actually in the market, usually, unless I put an airbag on, like I said uh, earlier, okay? But if you use it a contingency order, then that's where you that's where you factor in the bid and the ask and all that other stuff, okay? The ask would have to be a real market. So if a stock is asking below your stop it means that somebody wants to get out below your stop so just think about it logically when you go through the process after um, I know you guys here a lot of, I, I know we have a lot of regulars here but we also have a new a lot of new people here too uh, based on Tuesday's webinar um, I'm getting a lot of requests for bow ties so I just added bow ties to the free reports se section uh, it's an article that for traders magazine uh, in January of this year so on my website if you look at this sidebar there's a lot of information in the sidebar by the way okay it kind of gets a little cluttered at times but there's appearances from me special reports free reports my newsletter uh, search uh, service members login so it's a bit of a catch-all but if you're interested in the methodology and following along there's a plethora of information that I put in the sidebar, and I try to keep it as clean as possible. But anyway, right here is uh, free reports if you're looking for those. And bow ties is one of them. We're not getting to bow ties today because I've covered it ad nauseum. But uh, read that report if you get a chance. Uh, I do want to just touch briefly on TKOs. I got quite a few questions about them. For some reason, uh, it created some confusion uh, on um, Tuesday night. And all a TKO is, is, is a trend knockout, okay? Trend knockout. Knock, you know, CK, O-U-T. And by knockout, I mean that the market kind of gets knocked out, okay? So some players get knocked out. So anyone who has, somebody has a stop in here, they get knocked out of the stop. Uh, it also attracts eager shorts. People think, aha, this market is done. This stupid stock has a PE of a million, or it has no PE, I guess, PE of zero. So um, I think it's stupid that it's going up, so I'm going to short it. So market's going up really nicely. In this particular case, it's accelerating higher. Watch that uh, video that I did Tuesday night on stock selection. I talked a lot about acceleration and persistency. So this market is just working its way higher in a very persistent manner. When I say market, I mean stock in this particular case. This is a stock, obviously. Okay. And you got a nice little knockout move. So it means that it sells off hard. WRB is a wide range bar. So it has a nice wide range bar down, and that shakes out a lot of people. If you are long a stock and it's at a solid trend and you get stopped out, chances are that's a viable trend knockout. OK, so it's sometimes you could you could enter them just above the high and put a stop right above the low. You can trade them in a little bit of a textbook fashion. So that's the TKO in a nutshell. Uh, bow ties are at a special report. And um, as soon as time allows, I'll get it. I'll get a TKO pattern up there, too. I think I had a, a TKO was also in Traders Magazine. If not, I'll, I'll excerpt the uh the chapter from layman's and if you um if you're in a hurry for it just email me and i'll email you the chapter from layman's okay uh the other night this is just live from the other night we'll just cover real quick um 
because I want to get into the next slide before we hop into the markets. Uh, we talked about the fact that money management is often referred to as a holy grail, and it's vitally important. You're going to hear me talk about money management over and over and over again, probably too much, okay? Not too much because it's not important, but too much because I could probably make a lot more money in the educational business if I kind of skimmed over money management. Nobody wants to hear about money management, okay? So money management is really important. But your best defense is a good offense. So if you're in the best stocks to begin with, your money manager is going to be a lot easier because you're going to have less losses to worry about in, in the first place. And as I often preach, and I'm not going to tell the whole story again, but if you're getting stopped out a lot, 10 times in a row, 20 times in a row, then you're doing something wrong. Okay, Either your stops are too tight, so you need to study volatility and understand volatility. If a stock moves 20% in a day, we're long a little uranium stock. It's uh, up 8% Well, last time I checked. Okay, so it bounces around 8%, 10% or more a day. There was a popular methodology a while back says you should use an 8% stop. Somebody actually argued with me when I was giving a, a seminar over in uh, over at Golden Gate uh, University a couple of years back because um, they said I should use an 8% stop. Well, that's like saying that everybody should wear a medium-sized shirt, okay? And my fat ass had more medium shirt since I was 10 years old. Well, I'm exaggerating since I was six years old. Anyway, so your stops may be too tight. You have Your stops have to be outside of the normal volatility of the market. We've covered this a thousand times in these um, wicked charts. So just go in and watch the ones on YouTube. And here's the big thing here. Or you need to become a better stock picker. And that's why... That's what the whole course is on. And watch that intro course. There's a lot of good information just in that. Um, I, I got a lot of uh, feedback on this uh, slide from the other night. I know some of you guys here have seen it before, so bear with me. And it's something that I put in last minute into that stock selection um, intro. And my point is that if you can get better at your methodology, if you can get better at your stock picking, then the methodology – it proves it gets stronger and in doing that it's easier to follow your money management plan so that becomes a little stronger and guess what you're a little bit happier in the process and you're not bummed out so that becomes a little stronger so the three chords here or three strands I should say come together and strengthen anytime you get better at one and this is why I stressed the importance so much of picking the right stocks so, of course, learn money management. Of course, spend a lot of time on money management, especially early in your trading. And then spend a lot of time on position management. I just talked for 30 minutes about discretion. So spend a lot of time on that, too. But then make sure you're in the right stocks to begin with. So, again, not to beat the dead horse, but your best defense is often a good offense. Okay. A couple of announcements, and we'll hop into the charts. You guys want to start asking about individual stocks? Feel free to do now. Uh, I have a. I didn't put a date on this the other night, so the date is uh, June first, which is Monday. Uh, Three hundred dollars off on the stock selection course, money back guarantee on all my courses, unlimited lifetime support on all my courses. That's as it relates to the course itself. Okay, so if you have a question of any stock between now. And uh, as long as I'm on the face of this earth, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to help you. Now, be prepared to work. I might send you back and say, nope, you need to rewatch the second half or the third, whatever, the third half, third part or whatever of the stock selection course because you're, you're missing out on this persistency concept or whatever the case may be. So uh, go to my website, stop stock selection course, or you can just go to the website to hit products. And then here's the code, all lowercase, SSC300, no spaces. And then uh, watch the YouTube video from the other night. I just liked it on YouTube, so it should be up towards the top. YouTube.com, C is in custom, and then my name, Dave Landry, and you'll see the video up there. Here's the thing. If you like the video, you're going to love the course. If you don't like the video, then you're not going to like the course, okay? And my apologies to the ladies uh, in there. I got heck, I got heckled, and um, <laughs> I, I made the mistake of, of uh, justifying them with a reply. 
Uh, also, this week we have a special at the Core Trading Service. No promo code or anything needed. Okay, just go to uh, products and click on Trading Service, Core Trading Service, and then the new introductory rate right here, seven bucks. Okay, so daylander.com slash store or daylander.com trading service, and then down towards the bottom of the page, click there. And I just set it up right before the show. So seven bucks, no promo code or anything. And then obviously uh, any other stuff, uh, go to my store for that. All right, let's hop into the charts. Um, any questions, let's start. Uh, if you have questions on individual stock issues, let's start uh, start asking those now. And I'll go ahead and get my uh, chart set up and we'll do, um, we'll take a look at the overall market and then we'll work our way down into the individual issues and sectors. Okay. All right, first of all, let's take a look at the P's, S&P 500. Now, again, what is the market doing? It's doing what it has to do to frustrate the most people. So it took off yesterday. Oops. It took off yesterday. It looked like it was off to the races, and it was just – a Nats eyelash below all-time highs. In fact, it made all-time highs a couple days ago, okay? So just like last Friday, I think, it was at all-time highs. So that had everybody feeling pretty good. Hey, the market's fine. Water's great. Come on in. And then what happens? Bam, we get slammed here on, um, I guess that was Tuesday, okay, or, or Wednesday. Tuesday, I'm sorry. And I'm all mixed up because of the holiday. And then yesterday, it did big do-over straight back up, and now it's down a little bit. So it's kind of finding its way. And what I would suggest is you not try to predict it at this juncture because it's unpredictable. Well, Dave, if you can't predict it, what do you do? Well, if you have a stop in place, you honor your stop with a little discretion like we just talked about, okay? And then on new positions, you might want to be a little selective. Make sure you really, really like the setup, okay? Check out the stock selection course. Check out the intro to it. Just at least do that because that will that's going to save you a lot of trouble. I put a lot of good information just in that intro. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. Uh, it's just shy of all-time highs, which was yesterday, by the way. So I wouldn't rush out and short this market just yet. And remember, what we just learned is that usually it's going to be a process anyway, if there is a bear market, that's going to start. And nobody's going to ring a bell when it starts anyway. Now, if you follow along with uh, even just my free blog on my website, I'll be happy to point out when for you when it makes a bow tie down so you'll know when you might want to start being a little bit concerned about that. And I'll also I'll throw that 50-day moving average in there when things – I usually only, usually only put in the 50 when things get a little iffy. Um, but – it's worth watching and you can see that so far we're above it. We had a day or two below it, but so far we're nicely above it. And then like I pointed out in the S and P 500, we've only had, this is a one, two, three, four. We only had a handful of days. Oh, that's the 50. Let me put the 200 in. Sorry. If you take a look at like the 200 in the S and P 500, we've only had about five days below it over the last, um, several years five days below it using the measurement of daylight meaning that the highs are less than the moving average so if all you did was just look at daylight on the s p 500 it's not a perfect system but again i know i beat the dead horse on this but it will really help you keep you to keep you on the right side of the market so the point I'm trying to make here, believe it or not, I do have one, is let's not get too excited as long as the market is at or near new highs. Yes, I would like it to get out of this stupid range. I'd like to see a breakout like this, not look back for a while, and then pull up, pull back. But I'm just going to sit tight for now and not get too excited one way or the other. If I see a setup I really like, I'll take it. If I don't, I won't. A couple days ago, we had uh, two or three days in the service where it was nothing worthwhile taking. So what did I do? Well, if I'm not going to take anything, why should you? So I didn't recommend anything, okay? Coming today, I thought there's one kind of a little speculative, like a lot of the stocks have been lately, uh, a little bit more risky. 
but I thought it was worth a shot. It was an IPO. I think it could probably trade contra to the overall market. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty is a bit of a bummer. And my, let me see if I could change my uh, – I try to get my trend lines to work on a white chart and a, and a black chart, and it's just a compromise on both. I usually like cyan. Uh, Rusty's a bit of a bummer. You have what's what I well what a lot of people call a complex head and shoulders in the works. Now, if you're been around these shows, you know that I'm not going to tell you to rush out and use classical technical analysis in and of itself. But you want to, you do want to pay attention to it, okay? So you have a classical head and shoulders top in the works here, and let me just see if I can go to like, see if you go to like a like a weekly chart, it's it's small, but it's there, okay? And maybe you could kind of see it a little bit better. But on a on a daily chart, it's what I call a complex head and shoulders top. Now here's the deal: we are less than 2% away from all-time highs. So everybody wants me to quantify everything, but maybe maybe there is some sort of rule that I could actually quantify and say, as long as the market's less than 2% away from all-time highs, you want to mostly be long and not short too much, okay? Unless you really like a setup. Like we, we, liked, we shorted UAL recently because we liked it, okay? So maybe that's a good rule. But I just kind of eyeball things, and I could see, okay, this is the old high here. I had no idea it was 2%, but I knew it was close, and we're right here. So let's kind of err on the side of that longer-term trend. And you can see we got nice daylight well above the 200-day moving average. So I'm not a screaming bull in here, but I'm not too worried about this topic pattern unless it begins to materialize a little bit. But I'm paying attention. OK, and you need to always pay attention. Now, market was kind of coming unglued. Day before yesterday, and then what happened yesterday, it came roaring back with a vengeance. And what was kind of cool, if I could find it. Yeah, it was cool is that semi just absolutely took off, took off. Let's back up one day. Look at that. OK, and this is yet another testament to as long as the market's at or near new highs. Don't get too excited about it and err on the side of the longer term trend. And look at this, up 2%, almost 2 and 3 quarters percent, or certainly more than 2 and a half. So semi said a bang up day. Unfortunately, you know, markets, you know, what have you done for me lately? Not doing a whole lot today, kind of flatsville in here, but hanging in there at new highs. So again, not to beat the dead horse, but you want to err on the side of the longer term trend. Now, energies have become a bit of a disappointment. They look like the mother of all bottoms, and so far they're pulling back in here. So that's a bit of a disappointment. So on your stops, just in case. Let's take a look at crude. You can see crude still pulling back in here too, basis of USO. But to me, this still looks like a pretty serious bottom. Let's take a look at like a three-day chart. You can see you got a nice little first thrust still working here on a longer-term three-day chart. And let's take a look at the moving averages. You still got a bow tie in here. Now it's starting to roll over a little bit, and that's what stops it for, right? Let's take a look at a weekly chart here and see what we got. Yeah, so on a weekly basis, it still looks pretty good too. You can see it's just kind of a cup and handle and kind of pulling back. But on your stops, just in case, the energy stocks don't look too good right now, okay? We caught a nice little ride in them. Uh, I was hoping for a double or a triple. And they didn't quite do that, but at least we got a little pop out of it. We made a little money, and then we might get stopped out on our positions. But so what? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. We get paid to put money in harm's way. That's how we that's how we roll. Okay. Metals and mining. Metals and mining were doing pretty good too. We made a little money in steel and iron. What happened? Well, it began to roll back over. Okay. And now you got a bow tie down. Now I don't get too excited about low level bow ties. On the downside, I liked them on the upside. We had an upside bow tie here, which suggested that we could have a major bottom in place. But now they've rolled back over. So now that bottom might take a little time. Let's take a look at the dollar. This might be the culprit, a part of the culprit, 
of the metals rolling back over. The dollar topped out here. And uh, once again, boys and girls, notice that this top of the dollar was more of a process than an event. That's kind of the theme of this show. Okay. And you've got the bow tie here. You got the retrace back up, stalled prior to its old highs, rolled back over, took out support. I mean, you, there's so many technicals that are just all working here that you can see that it was more of a process than an event. But now the dollar's crawled back higher. So that's probably putting some pressure on those commodities. Commodities are dollar denominated. So when the dollar goes up, you could buy more commodities. So commodities are worth less. Okay. Some areas are at or near their old highs. Drugs at or near their old highs. Um, I sure would like to see them clear their old, old highs more decisively. But so far, so good. Health services kind of hovering around their old highs. So it's no big shocker that a lot of areas kind of look like the overall market itself. Now, transports are beginning to look a little ugly in here. And we broke down a few days ago right here. Okay. So, again, this is a process, not an event. And then, look, you got a bow tie down. And the bow tie down is off of all-time highs. Aha. This market may have topped, okay? And then let's throw that 200-day moving average in there just for S&Gs. And lo and behold, we have daylight below the 200-day moving average. The highs are less than the 200-day moving average. So I would say stick a fork in the transports. Now, what did I say earlier about what do you do when the market begins to roll over? Well, you short it. So we're short UAL. And the reason we short it is because it's rolled over and it's going down. So if you put your ego aside and just watch what's happening, you're, you're going to do just fine. Okay. And here's a case where a market appears to be topping out. So let's say you were long UAL. Well, guess what? If you had a stop in place, a reasonable stop in place, you would have got stopped out, maybe at a profit, maybe at a loss, okay? But you would be out of it, and if you have an open mind and be like water and go with the flow, right, you would actually be short this stock like we are, okay? Um, I don't want to go through too many more sectors, or in fact, uh, let's let's go ahead and get into the individual issues. Let me show you um, bonds real quick. Uh, again, another market that uh, appears to be topping or have to has topped. Okay, bow tie down, kind of sloppy, but bow tie kind of first thrust. And notice that here's your all time high. Here's your big throwback towards that high that you occasionally will get. Okay, that reverse check mark kind of gatekeeper-ish for those of you who, who are familiar with that pattern. And then you got a pretty serious slide in place. So if you were long bonds, I would think I would think you would have gotten stopped out way back here. And then, boy, you sure should think twice whether you want to rush out and buy bonds after that, okay? So, again, although it did kind of sell off fairly quick and fairly fast, the top here is what? A process more than an event. Now, at, all, at the time, it always feels like, a crash and like that's it and bam that's it but it is more of a process than an event if you think about it when you short stocks how many times do they have like a sharp retrace and knock you out right before the real rollover happens and that's just how the market tends to work on the short side i think people i think people uh fail to give up right away they hold on i think uh, eager shorts rush in it causes that first wave down people hold on they don't want to sell Bottom fishers come in. Even the people holding on, they don't want to believe it, so they buy more stock. And then that's where you get this big, stupid retrace rally. And then the shorts are like, oh, damn it, I'm losing a fortune here. I better rush it and cover it. So the market goes straight back up. And then some of the people that were long got to thinking, well, geez, I don't want to lose any more money. I better, I better sell while the selling's good. I'm back to break even. And then it's like that whole process sort of starts again. And maybe that's why it's a process more than an event. But, yeah, eventually it does and can it badly, but usually you have some warning along the way. Okay. Matt says, Sid, curious why the trailing stop didn't move up quicker as it went up after the profit target was hit. Well, I thought we had the mother of all bottoms in Sid, okay. And I, I kind of was being a little bit lenient 
and the, the trailing of my stop on, on this one, okay? And I think it stopped out at a profit though, nonetheless. But yeah, here's the thing. This is this move here. This is not gonna make you rich. This is gonna keep your lights on. This is gonna make you have a very nice trade, okay? And it's much better than poking the eye. This is the real money, okay? Let me back the chart out a little bit so you gain a little perspective on this. Well, I guess it won't work like I wanted it. Um, so I thought that this stock has a potential to maybe at least double. So that's the real prize. So let's not get, I don't get too caught up in what happens down here. So you get stopped out, you get stopped out, okay? I do take that first loaf off, that first partial profit, just in case, okay? And then lately I've been a little liberal, especially with something that's bottomed out like this, okay? The GFA, the SID, and some of those other ones in the portfolio. I don't want to pull up the portfolio right now because we have live trades going on. Um, but if you look at the snapshot from the other night, uh, a lot of those were using liberal stops to try to hang on for hopefully what will, what will turn into a longer-term trade. And the reason we're doing that is because a lot of times you will get these corrections, but the goal is to be able to ride out the correction and then have this thing take off again, and then we're in that trade for a long, 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 long time, okay? And yes, when you get stopped out and that trend does not materialize, the first question that comes to mind is, darn it, <laughs> you'd probably say something worse than that, why did we give it so much room? Why did we give up so much of an open profit? But when they stop before your stop is hit and turn around and rally 500%, then you say, oh, I now get it, okay? Market is iffy. Do you take fewer shares or less dollar risk? No, no. You have to always be consistent. You have to always be consistent. You should always risk the same amount on every trade. What you do is, and here's where it, where it all comes back to proper stock selection. What you do is you find best stocks, okay? And that's why I spent so much time teaching that stock selection course. And that's why I did uh, YouTube videos on it. And that's why we talk about it every week when we look at individual stocks. You want to pick the best and leave the rest. I know it's cliche, but... If you have a stock that could trade contra to the overall market, what do we make money in lately? We made some money in the China stocks, okay? We made some money in the steel stocks. We made some money in Latin America stocks. We made some money in Latin American steel stocks. All of these areas have their propensity or the ability, not the propensity, but the ability to trade contra to the overall market. Now, we didn't pick them just because of that. We picked them because we really liked the setup. But as an added bonus, it's kind of like, oh, I really like the setup. Market's a little iffy. What do I do? Well, it could trade contrary to the overall market. I think I'll take it. Okay. A couple of IPOs were thrown in there during this god-awful sideways market. Dude, the market's going sideways. Why would you buy stocks? Well, I really, really like the setup. So that's your number one litmus test. Number one, do you really, really like the setup? Number two, if you really like it, instead of really, really like it, do you really think that the market could trade that stock? I'm sorry, could trade contra to the overall market. If the answer is yes, then by all means, take it. All right, Don's here. Guess what he wants to know about? <laughs> ah, Ford. Well, it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to see that Ford is headed lower. And you don't want to be long Ford at this particular point in time. And Ford is also electric cardiogram at this point in time. So let's get the let's get electric cardiogram up. So Don gets the electric cardiogram award of the week. If I could find it. Well, you know what it looks like. Electro E L E C T R O. Well now it's a now I'm on a mission. Here we go. Wait for it. Beep, 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 beep. And then lately, beep. 
Yeah, there's no structure to that. Forget about that one, okay? S and DK is probably going up because it's a semiconductor. No, it's hardware. No, this is ugly, 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 ugly. This is Don again. Don, come on, Don. We're trend traders, okay? Am I, I going to have to whip out my business card? This is what an uptrend looks like. This is what a downtrend looks like. We want to trade with the trend. Even if this stock does rally, you've got a lot of overhead supply. This stock looks like it's in a lot of trouble. Let's back the chart way out. And like I preached the other night in the stock selection course on sale now, one of the most important things you could do is one of the most simplest things you can do is look at the net net price change. Where is the price today? Where is the price a month ago or a couple of months ago? Well, since 2014, July of 2014, the stock has lost 35% of its value. Now, it's not the most beautiful trend in the world, and I don't think I'd want to be short in this stock because it's all over the place, but draw your arrow, and it's headed lower. You new people, don't worry. It's like a, Don knows better, so I beat him up every week. I think he just likes to be beaten up. What's the what's the guy about the guys in the woods, and he goes to shoot the bear, and, and uh, all of a sudden he doesn't see the bear anymore, and the bear taps him on his back, and then the bear has his way with him. And then next day, it's like, uh, you know, he goes out into the woods and he goes to shoot the bear and the bear gets away from him and taps him on the shoulder and the bear has his way with him. And then, you know, finally, the guy goes, he's like looking in the woods, looking for the bear. And all of a sudden, the bear taps him on the shoulder and the bear's like, you're not out here for the hunting, are you? So, so maybe that's why Don comes back each week with these crappy setups. <laughs> I think I've used that joke before. Okay, uh, in your experience, what percentage of money managers use the 50-day moving average to gauge where the market is headed? I have no idea. Um, it's well watched, so it's worth watching. I tend to only put the 50-day moving average up on my screen when the market begins to kind of come unglued a little bit. Uh, I tend to only use my bow tie moving averages when A, the market is at high levels and begins to sell off, or B, a market is at low levels, kind of like uh, the steel and iron stocks, the selected metals and mining recently, uh, copper was was making a bottom based on that, but it didn't materialize. Um, so I only put those moving averages in when the market is sort of at the fringe, either at very low levels or very high levels. So, yeah, I have no idea how, how, how often it's used, but it's well watched, so it's worth watching. So plot that 50 on your chart every now and then, especially if the market begins to sell off a little bit. Uh, U.S. dollar stopping so far at 618 retracement leg down off lows and so far no more than a bounce so far. All right, let's take a look at that. Um, that's not a 618 from the lows, is it? Well, it'll be fascinating if it is. No, it looks like, uh, is that a 382? Or we, are you measuring down from the highs? Let's just do that for S&Gs. Yeah, from the highs. Yeah, okay, I see it now. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, good observation there. I'm not a huge fan of Fibonacci, but I will tell you this. Deep trade, deep retracements do exist, okay? In fact, at IPOs, I stopped, call, stopped short of calling it Fibonacci. Uh, well, maybe I did. <laughs> if you read my first book, I actually pointed out a Fib pattern in IPOs. But um, usually in an IPO, you do get that first deep retracement. And it is worth occasionally paying attention to a market. I don't trade off these deep retracements, but they do occur and they do happen. So I can't uh, I can't deny it. But, yeah, good observation there, Phil. I see what you're saying. It looks like the dollar is kind of hovering around that 618. Good, uh, good point. Thanks for your answer on Sid. Was thinking same and just wondering that uh, if it was your reasoning too, it did stop out of the profit. Yeah, it stopped. And, and, and here's the thing. Once from a psychological standpoint and from a statistical standpoint, but once you're at a profit, it means that the position has obviously moved in your favor. And once you're at a good profit and once that stopped, STOP is at a profit, then you could, you could be a little bit more relaxed. I know, haha, but a little bit more liberal with that stop knowing that you're going to give up some of that those open gains but also knowing that the potential exists for you to make a lot of money okay and in the end you're going to have to give up some okay like the example i use all the time we were up 211 percent of position and we got stopped out at 150 something percent well 
you make 150 something percent in every trade, you'll own the world pretty soon. So you have you can't focus on the fact that you were up that much. You have to focus on the net net. Did I make money in a trade? Yes. Pat yourself on the back and move on. Steve wants to know about CGNX. CGNX. Okay. Um, this looks like a big retrace to me. So as a trend guy, as a momentum guy, I, I'd have a hard time getting excited about it until it got past 60. Uh, I'm sorry, 52. So it'd have to get past 52, and then I would look to maybe play a pullback along the way. Okay. So I'd be a little concerned about that one. But once it gets past 50 something, then yeah, absolutely on a pullback. SEDG, I think that is uh, a good stock. Yeah, this one kind of eluded us. We had it as a setup back here, and it gapped away from us. So a um, bit of a bummer. But one thing I've learned quite early in this business is that you can't kiss all the women, okay? And sometimes they just get away from you. No methodology is perfect. What are you going to do? It just gapped away from us, okay? It happens. Um, but maybe on a pullback. But ideally now, I like to see it clear its prior highs a little bit better than it has so far. With IPOs, I'm a little bit more lenient in my patterns. But at this particular point in time, since this issue is fairly well established and now it's got a nice trend, uh, I would like to see it accelerate a little bit more before um, – or make some new highs, I should say. Matt says, stock selection course is great. Well, I, I swear I didn't uh, – checks in the mail, Matt. How's that? <laughs> I did, he's not a show. Uh, some things new and some already do, but sure needed to hear it again. Highly recommend it. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. Yeah, I got heckled the other night, <laughs> so it's good to have a friendly in here. Yeah, I mean, I, I pour my heart and soul every, into everything I do, and it's like I, I didn't get a chance to say it in the webinar, but I like to. Uh, I was told once that I, that you should teach like you're dying, um, and that you want to import your knowledge onto your uh, children. I know it's a little morbid, but it's. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. F E Y E. That's a crazy one, huh? Let's find it here. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it for those kind words. Okay, Don wants to know about F E Y E. F E Y E. All right, finally, Don gives me a stock that I might be able to do something with. Uh, yeah, Don, it's breaking out to new highs, so it's looking pretty good. So um, I'm not a breakout guy, but what I will consider is uh, a first pullback after a base breakout. So if it makes a pattern that looks like that, it might be worth considering. Now, what I will do with this one is at the end of today, when I run my scans, this is going to come up as a stock at a new 52-week high. So I might actually put this in my momentum list and watch it longer term. Uh, it did kind of fall from grace in here, but I think that a lot of those bad memories have worked their way through the system. So yeah, Don, by all means, put that on your momentum list and keep an eye on it. Sell your uh, sell your Ford and wait for a chance to buy this uh, stock here. Grazie, uh, ciao. All right, Marco, ciao, ciao, a dopo. <laughs> Just think how much fun I'm going to have when it's my turn to have the bear, Dave. Don. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. I don't. I don't want to visualize that either. Okay, some uh, just inching up. Any thoughts? Yeah, Summit has been a pretty good one. It's been on my momentum list for a while. Um, at this particular point in time, because it's had a pretty good run in here, uh, I would like to see it pull back. But, yeah, this needs to be on your momentum list. I, I think this is in my uh, Landry 100 list. Um, anything that's banging out new highs with vigor is going to be on that list. So, yeah, keep an eye on that one. I think it's worth a shot, uh, Rich, but only on a pullback. Well, looks like our time is up. Uh, geez, I, I have so much fun doing these shows. I, I can't believe that um, I get paid to do them. Well, I actually don't get paid to do them, do I? <laughs> no, I have a blast doing them. I appreciate you guys showing up. I'm flattered by your um, – you guys be in here. Don't be shy about asking questions. I won't beat you up unless you ask about the same stock over and over and over again, Don. Um, anyway, any unanswered questions, you know the routine. Shoot me an email at david.davelander.com. I answer all my emails eventually. Um, 
thanks again. I'm humbled by your appearance. Thanks for showing up. I appreciate you taking time on your busy schedule. Uh, anything unanswered, again, shoot me an email, and uh, I'll either answer you directly, or if it's a more involved answer, I'll put some slides together, and we'll cover it uh, next week. It'll be fodder for the next show. So, again, thanks, everyone, again. Everyone have a fantastic weekend. We'll talk again, and then uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much.